Hey, welcome to 12 Tone. When Britney Spears released her first album in 1999, I was nine years old and a boy, and like most nine-year-old boys at the time, I was not interested. Even as she dominated the charts, my social circles regarded her as more of a punchline than an artist, a perfect example of how pop music sucked because it wasn't written specifically for me. But I'm not nine years old anymore, and with a little more wisdom and humility, I can look back and admit that I was very, very incredibly wrong. Britney Spears rocks, she always has, and if you're in the same boat I was, I hope you'll humor me as I break down one of her biggest hits, Toxic. Let's take it apart. The song starts with its iconic string riff, and immediately we've got a lot to talk about, but I think the best place to start is with the rhythm because these two bars of music could not be more different. In the first one, we have 11 notes, including multiple rapid 16th note runs, while the second bar has only five notes, less than half of the previous one, and four of those are on the four beats with just one stray eighth note breaking the metronome pulse. The articulation is also pretty different. In the slow bar, the notes are held long and the transitions between them are smooth, but in the fast bar, in the rare instances where there's space between the notes at all, they're played as sharp staccato stabs. And the production takes that even further. On a real violin, no matter how short you play the notes, the sound will always take a bit of time to decay, but here, on the longest gap in the bar, there's an instantaneous cutoff. I'm not sure if they get this effect by muting the track there, or if they just sped it up to eliminate the decay time, but either way, it creates this unnatural, uncanny valley feeling, where it sounds like a violin, but it doesn't quite behave like one, like there's a bit of a glitch in the matrix. This extreme rhythmic difference between the two bars gives the riff a sort of call-and-response vibe, where the more difficult fast bar is meant to be listened to, while the simpler, slower bar invites you to sing along. It also creates the impression that the music is constantly stopping and starting again, a feeling that's accentuated by the register. The lines are played two octaves apart, with the fast bar chugging along in a nice, comfortable low register before it literally screeches to a halt in the shrill, high-pitched slow bar. But there is one thing these two bars have in common. Notes. Well, almost. The first bar is basically just walking up and down the scale from C to E flat. It's a fairly tight melody, moving mostly in steps with the occasional third, and while it features some Ds, they're all buried in weak rhythmic positions. The second bar does mostly use those same three notes, but it can't resist one final difference, so it starts off with an F sharp, then leaps down to D and sits there for a while. Honestly, just looking at the riff, you might even view this as a chord change. The first bar was spelling out C minor, but D and F sharp together imply D major. I don't think that's the best analysis, though, because the bar closes with the same walk down from E-flat to C, and once the guitar comes in, it just plays C minor throughout. Which means we'll need another explanation for these notes at the start. Fortunately, jazz theorists have us covered. They're what's called tensions, which are notes that aren't chord tones but that sound good over it anyway. In this case, D is a major ninth, which is a stable but pretty mature sound, especially over a minor chord, while the F sharp is the sharp 11. Typically, you'd see sharp 11s over major or dominant chords, so placing it over a minor chord instead is pretty shocking, and that dissonance is amplified by the fact that it's happening right on the downbeat. They really want this line to put you on edge, and it does, but not so much that it doesn't still work and after a couple repetitions, you get used to it and it starts to feel pretty natural. And the last thing I want to mention before I move on is something you may not have even noticed. The last time they play the riff before the verse, the high bar is accompanied by this background vocal line singing roughly the same part. Honestly though, that thing I notated is barely even correct. It's the basic shape of the line, but the actual part is full of microtonal decorations. That is, she's sliding around in the space between the 12 standard notes. Microtonality is rare in Western popular music, but these sorts of ornamentations are common in some non-Western traditions, including Arabic and Indian music. Here though, I don't think they're really being used to evoke those cultures specifically. As we'll see, this song borrows different kinds of musical gestures from a bunch of different traditions. All those influences sort of blur together into something that doesn't really sound like it belongs to any of them, so you're just kind of left with this weird otherworldly effect where you can't quite pin down what the song is supposed to remind you of. From there, we move into the verse. Baby, can't you say I'm this first part's pretty straightforward. We're continuing that C minor from the riff, so the harmony is staying static, and the melody is mostly walking between C and E flat like the riff did. This is the same musical building blocks, but slowed down a bit to allow for clear vocal delivery. Then we get this. Where the harmony goes to E flat major, the flat three chord, while the melody does the same walk down as before, but this time it starts on D, which over this chord is the major seventh, and goes to B flat, the fifth. Starting on the seventh continues our theme of advanced harmonic notes in the melody, while ending on the fifth provides a bit of rest, which we're gonna need for this last bit. I'm fine. 
where the harmony plays G major, but Spears leans heavily on a B flat, the minor third. Minor thirds in the melody over major chords is a blues staple, but in this context, it doesn't feel like the blues. Or, I mean, all Western popular music is blues influenced, but beyond that, this part doesn't feel especially bluesy, and again, I think that comes down to the way the song borrows decorations from so many different traditions. It's a blues move, but it's not really surrounded by other blues sounds, so you don't get that sense of stylistic context. From there, the riff comes back, but I can't move on from the verse without mentioning the number one driver in this section, the bass. It's incredibly active, effectively providing a counter melody to the vocals. <laughs> I especially want to highlight this sort of pyramid walk it does before the transition to E-flat, because I think it's the most important part of the whole verse. We've been sitting on C minor for so long that going somewhere new is an event, and this line really sells that, foreshadowing the new chord by walking up to its root, then turning around, sliding back down, then finally walking up for real just in time for the chord change. If this had just been C's the whole time... The transition would still be fine, but it wouldn't be nearly as exciting. This verse is also a great example of the sonic functions model we talked about in a recent video, link in the description. Basically, the idea is that in modern pop music, motion is generated not just by harmonic and melodic gestures, but also by orchestral ones. That is, by changing which kinds of sounds you're hearing. Normally, this is most obvious in the transitions between sections, but here they manage to fit a whole sonic journey into a single verse. We start with a setup establishing an energetic bass line with a standard combo of vocals, guitar, bass, and drums. <laughs> Can't you say I'm calling? and sit in that for the first four bars. When the chords change, we move to the build-up with the introduction of some slow, swelling string pads. The addition of a new instrument increases the sonic tension, which mirrors the increase in harmonic tension from the new chords, and finally that all resolves into the climax, where the strings shift to the foreground and play the riff again, releasing all that tension into an explosion of musical energy. Having such a clear, multi-part sonic structure in a verse of all places makes this song feel frantic and exciting. It gets your blood pumping. From there we move into the pre-chorus, which is a larger scale version of a build-up. The instruments are mostly the same, but the vocals switch from a low, fry-heavy delivery to a soft, airy falsetto accompanied by a bell synth. <laughs> The chord is still C minor, but the notes have become a whole lot more interesting. We start by going to A, the major 13th, which is a really gnarly sound over a minor chord because it's a tritone away from the flat 3. In fact, this note isn't even in the key, but if we played an A flat here instead, it rubs even harder against the G, so typically if you are going to put a 13th on a minor chord, you'll make it major. It's still a pretty dissonant note, though. From there we get this which is the first real leap we've heard in the vocal melody. Up to now, it's been steps with the occasional third, so this perfect fifth up followed by a minor sixth down is pretty shocking, especially since it goes to F, another tension against the underlying harmony. The line ends with this, another B flat over a G major chord, and then we get this beautiful fake out where they play the riff again, implying a return to the verse, but instead of going there, we get this. It's another classic build-up technique. If you got the orchestral energy set at a certain level, suddenly dropping to a much calmer one can actually increase tension, because you know it's about to come back even stronger. It's an especially useful tool when the energy is already pretty high. A surprise quiet section means you don't have to add that much to the return in order to get that climax effect. Like, if we look at the chorus... The orchestration's pretty similar. There's an added cymbal in the drums, and of course the distorted electric guitar at the end, but without the pause in between, this transition wouldn't feel nearly as punchy. But let's talk about the chorus. It starts with a familiar chord motion, with C minor going to E flat. But instead of going to G again, it just starts sliding down in half steps. There's a couple ways to analyze this, and I could bust out some fancy terms like tritone substitution to make myself look smarter, but honestly, I think the explanation here is pretty simple. Half-step motion sounds good. Sliding down like this has a sort of melty quality to it, like you're succumbing to the metaphorical drug Spears is singing about. Speaking of which, let's check in with the vocals. You're toxic, I'm slipping under. Okay, that's interesting. She's jumping back and forth between C and G, the two most stable points in C minor, so even as the chords are falling through all sorts of weird tonal spaces, the melody never loses the key. If we try to read these as chord tones, they're pretty advanced. The G is a half step above the F sharp in the D7 chord, and when we go to D flat 7, the C natural in the melody sits right between the harmonies D flat and C flat, but because there's such strong scale degrees, that complexity gets hidden just enough to make it all sound good, and it becomes just another kind of weird note in this song's impressive collection. The second half of the the chorus starts the same way, but instead of going to D7, we get a flat 7. And this, I think, 
is a tritone substitution. Basically, in a dominant seventh chord, the main driver of the resolution is the tritone between its major third and minor seventh, but the funny thing about tritones is that they're symmetrical. In a flat seven, the tritone goes from C up to G flat, but G flat is the same thing as F sharp, and F sharp up to C is also a tritone. Spelled like this, though, they become the third and seventh of D7, the chord we saw here before, so the two chords can be used somewhat interchangeably, resolving to the same places. The melody even plays up this relationship. I'm addicted to you. Arpeggio the space between the two shared notes. So why the switch? Well, this bar features the return of the string riff, so moving to A-flat-7 instead lets us use a chord that better incorporates the E-flat from that line. It also helps set expectations. We've been doing mostly half-step resolutions for our dominant sevenths, so the A-flat-7 serves as a big flashing sign that we're about to hear a G chord, and boy do we. This brings us to the last bar of the chorus, and there's a lot going on here. I'm gonna start with the most prominent part, the sudden introduction of a distorted electric guitar. And here's a sentence I did not expect to say in a video about a Britney Spears song. That's the Hendrix chord. I made a whole video about this chord, link in the description, but as the name implies, the Hendrix chord is a specific chord voicing popularized by rock legend Jimi Hendrix. It's basically a dominant shell voicing, or a dominant seventh chord voice without a fifth, but on top he adds a minor third, which clashes with the major third in the lower register. The Hendrix chord is traditionally played on an electric guitar through heavy distortion, so the dissonance of these intervals multiplies, creating an intense, disorienting soundscape. I should note that Hendrix usually played this as the one chord in his songs, whereas here it's the five, so it's not exactly faithful to the source material, but that's nothing new for Toxic. It's just another weird sound for our collection. That said, most transcriptions I could find just called this G major or G7, and I understand why. If you listen to the guitar on its own, the B-flat isn't too hard to pick out, but this guitar part is far from the only thing happening in this bar. We also have the ending of the string riff. The vocals keep arpeggiating that tritone from A-flat 7. Don't you know that you're toxic? And the bass is doing something, too. In total, between all the parts, I count nine distinct notes in this bar, so ultimately I'm not really sure it's best viewed as a chord at all. It's chaos, throwing together so many parts that don't fit with each other and creating an almost violent level of dissonance in the process. It's a perfect end to the chorus's narrative structure, a complete disorienting loss of musical control. The only thing holding it together is the bass line. We tend to gravitate to the lowest notes to define the harmony, so this G to D flat motion implies that what's happening is just another tritone substitution, first hitting the five chord, then swapping it out for its substitution dominant before resolving by half step back to one. That's the harmonic impression I get from listening to this bar, and even though it fails to describe 90% of what's actually happening, I think it's the correct structure, with everything else serving as just a massive pile of decoration. This leads into the post-chorus, which is mostly the same, but the melody has been replaced with this surf guitar line. <laughs> I don't have a lot to say about this part, it's mostly just playing roots and arpeggios, but I wanted to mention it because it's yet another example of this song borrowing an aesthetic from a musical tradition it doesn't really belong to, contributing to that hodgepodge of influences that makes it so difficult to pin down. At some point, you'd expect this mountain of competing stylistic cues to just collapse into chaos, but they introduce them slowly enough and with enough care that it never really does. And finally, we come to the breakdown where we get another microtonal line over the chorus progression. <laughs> Up to now, the microtonal stuff has been hidden in the background, but here it becomes the main melody, further elevating its status as a key sonic element of the track. The line itself is mostly just another arpeggiation of C minor, but there is one spicy thing, this G flat. It's played over the E flat chord, giving us another variation on that minor third over major chord sound that we've come to expect. G flat is a tritone away from C though, so unlike the B flat over G major thing, with a note at least fit with a key, here the G flat just sticks out like a sore thumb. This is sort of a callback to the F sharp in the main string riff, but honestly, Honestly, I think it's mostly just a tritone for tritone's sake, which leads to one more potential influence. Metal. Metal loves sticking random tritones in the middle of riffs, and if the same line was played in the lower register of a distorted electric guitar, it'd sound metal as heck. At the end of the breakdown, everyone drops out, leaving just the vocals with an overt autotune effect. Taste of your lips, I'm on a ride to add one last weird sound. The dropout also serves to set up the final chorus where they've added more of the electric guitar to make it feel even bigger than the previous ones, creating a thunderous climax before the song ends on the post-chorus with Spears singing a new melody built on that same C to E flat motif. Intoxicate me now, with your love and now. And that's pretty much it. Toxic changed the face of pop music because it wasn't afraid to experiment with all sorts of unrelated sounds to build exactly the effect it wanted, creating an otherworldly atmosphere by mixing and matching stylistic cues from different traditions, and 
and going through it like this makes it clear just how many ideas went into this song. It's an incredibly intricate tapestry of carefully woven musical events that fit together so delicately that you barely even notice that they don't actually fit, and that takes a lot of skill. Oh, and before I go, I should mention I have a Twitch channel now. I've mostly been streaming Go and answering questions about music, YouTube, and other stuff. If you do Twitch and that sounds interesting, give me a follow at twitch.tv slash 12tone videos. Or don't. Just wanted to let y'all know. Anyway, thanks for watching. As always, this song was chosen by my patrons on Patreon. The poll to pick the next one goes up over there next week. You can also join our mailing list to find out about new episodes, like, share, comment, subscribe, and above all, keep on rocking.